Minister Joyce DeGrasse from Love Gospel Assembly. And I have a question for you. I'm sure you've heard that. Question is, what's love got to do with it? The whole world is looking for love. Turn on the TV, the radio, at least 80% of the songs that you hear have to do with love. I love you, she loves me, she doesn't love me, he doesn't love me, he might love me. It's all about love. And Beyonce says she's crazy for love. But what is love, really? We watch TVs and movies, and somewhere in that half hour or that hour, somebody says, I love you. But what do they mean? Do they mean, I love being with you? Or do they mean, I like the way you dress? Or do they mean, I like the way you make me feel? Maybe they just mean, I like the way you iron my shirts. Could be any of those. But that's not about loving the person. That's about loving what the person does for you. I remember when I was a little girl, on Saturdays, my father used to take me to the big park in the back of the projects. And I would play with the other kids and have fun. And when it was time to leave, he'd call out my name. He'd say, Joyce, time to go. And I'd run up to him. And the first thing he would say is, would you like to go get some ice cream? And I said, oh, yeah, Daddy, you know I love ice cream. I love ice cream. Can you really love someone or something who cannot love you back? Hmm. Webster's Dictionary defines love as a strong affection or a liking for someone or something, or a passionate affection for someone of the opposite sex. But that doesn't really apply to biblical love. So I looked into Strong's Dictionary of Biblical New Testament and Old Testament words to see what it had to say about this. And this is what it says. The word for love is agape, and it defines, it's defined this way. The word agape describes the attitude and the actions of godly love. Not human love, but godly love. John 17, 6 says, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. That's the attitude of God towards his son. So let's talk about this attitude a little bit. This kind of love is a way of thinking or feeling about someone, and it's reflected in your behavior. John 3.16, which we all know, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God made Jesus known to us so that we would understand what it's like to have that kind of love, so that then in return, we would be able to love others. Secondly, the word agape describes this kind of love and how it causes a mutual kind of love, the fact that God gave his son. That's John 3.16. The word agape says how far Jesus was willing to go to show his love for us. He could have said to the Father, I don't think I want to die for them. They don't deserve it. But he didn't, because he had that kind of agape love for us. John 14, 21, Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. In other words, God and Jesus know exactly how we feel, good, bad, or otherwise. Agape also describes the attitude of God toward the human race. John 3.16 again. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So let's take a look at two people in the Bible that had to deal with love. Real love. Or at least what they thought was real love. Real love means being able and willing to give up everything, even your life, for the one you love. That's what God did for us. As we look through the Bible, we see examples of what biblical love is and what it isn't. So let's take a look at this. First of all, the Bible tells us that God gave his only son. Think about your children. Would you sacrifice them for someone you never met? Would you sacrifice them for a liar? How about a cheater? A child molester that tells you that they were changed? Do you think that the biblical characters are good enough for God to sacrifice his son. 
In fact, do you think that we're good enough? Let's look at two of them. First is Job's wife. In the book of Job, we read about how Job was upright and blameless in God's sight. God favored him with children, land, thousands of animals, yet he lost everything to the Chaldeans. His 10 children, his money, his animals, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and numerous servants, seven sons, three daughters, his house collapsed. And yet, Job said, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. God even allowed Satan to afflict him with boils and sores, and yet he still would not curse God. Job's wife thought he was crazy. You love that kind of God? Why don't you just curse God and die, she told him. Would that be love? Is that someone, something you would say to someone that you profess to love? How about Sarah? In the book of Genesis, God promised to make a great nation of Abraham's descendants, but there was a problem. Sarah was not able to have children. Time went on, one year after the other after the other, and Sarah was 75 years old, too old to have children. So she came to an obvious conclusion. Abraham should have a baby with his servant Hagar. Sarah thought, how else could God's promise be fulfilled? It's impossible otherwise. So Hagar had a baby with Abraham. And Hagar then began to think of herself as the lady of the house. I mean, after all, she was the mother of the master's son. Sometime later, three men came to Abraham's tent with a message. They said to him, your wife Sarah is going to have a baby. What? By now, Sarah was 90 years old. And Abraham was 100. A baby? But see, through Sarah, though Sarah and Abraham did not understand it, God was doing something extraordinary. When he makes a promise, he keeps it, even if you're 90 or 100 years old. Don't we make similar mistakes? Sarah assumed that maybe God forgot, so she took matters in her own hands and made sure that there would be a baby. Don't we do that sometimes? Isn't it true that even though God has told us how we should act and what we should do, when it doesn't happen, we try to fix it ourselves, and then we wind up creating unnecessary problems. So now we've got two women living in the same house, raising Abraham's children. The problem was Hagar was still a servant. What in the world has love got to do with this situation? In the end, it's not about how good we are. It's about how good God is. So to answer the question that I asked in the beginning, what's love got to do with it? The answer is everything. The love of God has everything to do with it. It gives hope to those who are sick, boldness to those who are timid, confidence to those who are unsure, and love to the unlovable. It's all about the goodness of God. That's what love's got to do with it. Thank you for joining us in this week's Nuggets of Hope. We pray that you were encouraged and strengthened. We invite you to join us every Wednesday on Instagram and Facebook for another message. We would like to also invite you to our Sunday services. I would like to leave you with a prayer found in Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. God bless you. How come everybody else gets to sit down? Well, for their nuggets? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>